Hello and welcome to this revision video for Biology Paper 1. For this paper you need to know topics 1 to 4 in your revision guide. We'll start off with topic 1 which is all about cell biology and we'll talk in particular first of all about the different parts of cells. So with animal cells first of all you need to label various different parts. You need to know this part here which controls the cell activity and that is called the nucleus. It is where the DNA is kept of the cell as well, so it controls all the cell activity and it's also where that genetic information is. The outside of the cell controls the movement of substances in and out of the cell, and that is the cell membrane. These little dots around the inside of the cell are where proteins are made, and these are called the ribosomes. These parts are mitochondria, and within the mitochondria, that is where respiration takes place to release energy for the cell. And finally, all of the jelly-like substance that um, forms the majority of the cell is called cytoplasm, and this is where chemical reactions take place. This here, then, is a classic animal cell. This is just our model for all of the cells within an animal. However, as we'll talk about later, they don't all have this shape. An animal cell is also one of the eukaryotic cells, just like plant cells. This means that they have structured organelles within the cell. For example, these mitochondria here, structured compartments, or the nucleus. So these eukaryotic means that it has things such as the nucleus and the mitochondria and other structured parts within the cell. This cell here looks a bit different and this is our model for a plant cell. So it has, it is also another eukaryotic cell because of the, um, the highly structured subcellular parts within the cell. And it has a number of structures that are the same as an animal cell. For example, it has a cell membrane, which is this inside membrane going around the out going around the cell just here. It has a nucleus, which again contains the genetic information of the cell. Because plant cells also respire, it's got mitochondria, and it also has the cytoplasm and the ribosomes as well to make proteins. But you'll notice that there are three extra things that it has as well. It has a cell wall to strengthen the cell. It has chloroplasts, which are these parts here, for photosynthesis. These are filled with a green pigment called chlorophyll. So chloroplasts are full of chlorophyll, which is the green pigment pigment that absorbs the sunlight. And I'll just say at this stage as well, you might see a, a word called cellulose. That's what the cell wall is made up of. Okay, so it's made up of a, a structure called cellulose. And the final one that's extra, so we've had cell wall, chloroplast, and the final one that's extra in plant cells is this vacuole, and this holds cell sugar and sap. So they sometimes call it so water and sugar held within this vacuole and it helps keep the cell in a particular shape. The final cell that we're going to look at is a bacterial cell. You may see them with or without this flagellum here, this is just for movement, um, so you could see just this part of the cell here, not all bacterial cells would have this flagellum, but you will see that for movement. This, however, is not a eukaryotic cell. This is an example of a prokaryotic cell. It's a much simpler cell, and it doesn't have those structured compartments inside. So one of the key things um, to show you it's prokaryotic is it's got loose DNA. So it doesn't have a nucleus like the eukary eukaryotic cells. So it's loose DNA, but also they sometimes have this plasmid, or several plasmids, and that itself is a loop of DNA and that comes up in genetic engineering um, in paper 2 as well. 
ribosomes here like we've had before to make the proteins. We've had cytoplasm before in both animal and plant cells, um, which is where the chemical reactions happen. And we've had a cell membrane in the animal and plant cells and a cell wall, just like the plant cells, to strengthen it and give it more structure. For paper one in biology, one of the required practicals that you'll need to look at is preparing a specimen under a microscope. So microscopes are used to see really small objects. This here is a light microscope, which uses light, um, and it can be used to, to see things such as cells, for example, and it can see some small subcellular parts within that cell. However, the better microscopes to use are microscopes called electron microscopes that use electrons to view images and beams of electrons rather than light. And with electron microscopes, they're really expensive, so, you, so it's not something that you'd probably see within, within school. Um, but it allowed them to see smaller parts of cells, such as ribosomes and plasmids, which are the rings of DNA. And these electron microscopes have a higher magnification, so you can zoom in further to be able to see these smaller parts of the cell. And as well as that, they have a higher resolution. So you may well have to um, describe how to set up a microscope. So you would start off with your glass slide. You would put your specimen on that. For example, it could be a small section of onion or it could be a swab of cheek cells or whatever it is. And you would then have to stain it with some kind of dye, for example, iodine or something like that. So you'd put a few drops of dye iodine for example onto your specimen and then over the top you would put a cover slip to protect the uh, microscope from that that stain that you're going to put on there. You then put that under your microscope so let's have it positioned under here and we start off with the lowest magnification. To calculate the magnification you do whatever value you have on the eyepiece multiplied by whatever value you have on the lens. For example, in school microscopes, many of them will have times 10 on the eyepiece and then a number such as 4, maybe 10 and then 40 on the lenses. So if we use the lowest magnification first of all, we'd be doing 4 from the lens multiplied by the eyepiece and we'd be getting 40 times magnification. We then use our two different adjusters. So often on a microscope, you'll get a large um, adjuster and then a smaller one as well. So this one we would use first. This is the coarse adjuster to focus onto our image and then the fine adjuster to get really, really clear image. Once you've done that, you can then change the magnification. You can increase it to 40, uh, increase it from 40, for example, to then 100 times and then 400 times magnification. Final thing that you need to do is draw what you see under the microscope. For example, if I had onion cells, I might see something like this. And you would draw in pencil and make sure that you don't shade in any of the things that you see. So, for example, if I do a nucleus here, I'm not going to shade that in. I then label my diagram up with all the parts that I can see. So a nucleus, cell membrane, cell wall, and I might want to write the cytoplasm on there, for example. And then I finish off my diagram, which is done neatly in pencil with the magnification I looked at. So I looked at, at 40 times magnification. And finally, you'd finish off by just giving your sketch an image, uh, a title, sorry, to show what you have drawn. Still on the topic of um, microscopes, you may be asked to use this equation here 
to either calculate magnification image size or real size so you may have to rearrange it if you need to for example this question says a bacterial cell was viewed at 100 times magnification the width of the Im image under the microscope was 0 0.25 millimeters what is the real width of a bacterial cell and it says give your answer in standard form so we would need to rearrange this to make it real size equals so real size equals image size divided by magnification and then we can put our numbers in so our image size was 0.25 millimeters and we would divide that by our magnification which is up here which is 100 and then we would get our real size of 0 0.0025 and our final thing is to give it in standard form so apply your understanding of maths to this and we would write this in standard form as 2.5 times 10 to the minus 3 millimeters next we'll talk about cell specialization at the top of the video we looked at an animal cell a plant cell and a bacterial cell obviously with more detail but we said at the time that these are just models not every cell in an animal or a plant or a bacteria looks like that and these are three examples this one here is a sperm cell from an animal all of these are from animals this one here is a nerve cell and this one here is a muscle cell and what these cells have done is that they've all gone through a very special process called differentiation and what that means is they've started off as an undifferentiated cell an undifferentiated cell has the potential to turn into any type of cell but it would have got in the process of differentiation a signal to turn into a very specific cell and then it turns into for example a sperm cell or a nerve cell or a muscle cell so in this case we say this is a differentiated cell or sometimes we call that a specialized cell in animals most differentiation takes place during development and after that the cells can't differentiate anymore they've already been switched on turned into a very particular shape and they will stay that shape and do a particular function however in plants um, there are very special cells in the meristem tissue that can differentiate throughout their life so lots of lots of plant cells can differentiate and change into different types of plant cells whereas in animals all of that has happened during development and then as adult cells they cannot change so how is a sperm cell specialized well it's got things such as a tail for swimming and it has in the head of the sperm here these are lots of mitochondria and they help to release energy for the movement of the sperm because if you remember in mitochondria that is where respiration occurs the nerve cell here you can see it's a very different shape again it's very long it has branch connections at the end to transfer signals onto many other nerve cells the muscle cell again a totally different shape this is again full of mitochondria a really hot topic in the exam they like to link the fact that mitochondria is where energy is released from during respiration so with um, muscle cells they need to contract a lot to allow movement and therefore they are full of mitochondria to release energy here are three examples of plant specialized cells so we said actually there's um, lots of plant cells that can differentiate throughout their lifetime but here are three very particular examples this is a very common one this is a root hair cell as you'll notice there are no chloroplasts because it's found underground where the roots are 
And the main thing about the root hair cell is that it has a very large surface area in order for it to absorb water and mineral ions. This diagram here is supposed to show the xylem inside the plant. We'll talk about that later on in, in more detail, but very briefly, it carries water throughout the plant and it has um, a hollow structure. It's made out of dead cells and to help it um, have, a, have a better structure, it is supported by a structure called lignin in its walls. Again from a plant here you've got the phloem, we'll talk about this in more detail later on, but the phloem is a group of cells that are elongated and joined together. They have pores here to allow substances through between cells. And they also have very few subcellular parts, which means the, the things that are inside the cell. So they have very few subcellular parts because the main job of the phloem is to transport the food, to transport the glucose around the plant. Still on the theme of cells, we're going to talk about some very special cells called stem cells. Stem cells are special because they are undifferentiated. They haven't been switched on and turned into a very specific specialised cell. They still have the ability to become any type of cell. That's what undifferentiated means. They can become any type of cell. So there's two types of stem cells that we associate with humans. First of all, in an adult, in the adult bone marrow, we can find stem cells. The bone marrow is the stuff within inside the bone. So if this here is a, is a bone, the bone marrow is tissue which is inside and it contains lots of undifferentiated cells. Normally these switch on um, and are differentiated into red blood cells. But if we take them out, they can make many other different types of cells. Even better than adult bone marrow are stem cells that come from embryos and we call those embryonic stem cells. So normally when a sperm meets an egg during fertilisation and the egg is fertilised, after a little while that fertilised egg will start to divide into two and four and so on and make a small ball of cells. And that initial ball of cells there is called the embryo and that will start to divide and then obviously develop into a human being. So it's unsurprising therefore that these are undifferentiated stem cells because they are eventually going to in turn into all of the different types of cells in your body. So these embryonic stem cells are slightly better than the adult bone marrow is because they can differentiate into a bigger variety of cells. So the idea is then that if somebody would need some a new muscle or a new heart, that they would take one of these stem cells out of the embryo and switch it on and cause it to differentiate into a particular cell, for example, a muscle cell. So they'd perhaps want to make some muscle tissue or maybe in the future even a heart for somebody or heart valves that need replacing to treat a particular disorder that you might have. The benefit of this therapeutic cloning is that it is not rejected by the body. Okay, because it contains your DNA, your body doesn't see it as foreign and doesn't reject it. Obviously there is a lot of ethics um, associated with both the use of bone marrow and embryonic stem cells. Ethics is the study of things that are right or wrong. So you need to think of advantages and disadvantages of these two processes. This one obviously involves quite a painful operation to remove the bone marrow. The only extra thing just to add here is not to leave out plants. 
And just remember that the stem cells or the undifferentiated cells in plants come from tissue called the meristem tissue and many of the plant cells remain undifferentiated throughout their life. This next section is on the cell cycle and mitosis. And this type of cell division, which we'll discuss in a minute, is for growth and repair within inside the body. Growth, so during development, so it has the embryos dividing, for example, that is dividing by mitosis, and also within the body when the cells need to be replenished and replaced. So the cell cycle is comprised of two parts. The main part of it is the cell growing and replicating its DNA. So the main part is growth and DNA replication. And then the final part that completes that cell cycle is the mitosis. And that is the actual cell division that takes place. So normally within a cell, the genetic information, the DNA, is kept within the nucleus. But it is normally just loose and unraveled because it needs to be read and it needs to, to be used to make proteins. But as part of this growth and DNA replication stage, there's a few things that happen. The first thing that happens to this cell, which will need to grow and divide, is that it grows. And to prepare it for division, it increases the number of subcellular parts. Things such as mitochondria, for example and ribosomes because shortly this is going to become two, two cells so it needs more of these subcellular parts to go around. The second thing that it does is it signals this DNA to form chromosomes which are the packages of DNA. And within the nucleus you will have 23 pairs of chromosomes formed, which makes 46 in total. And when they're first packaged, they'll look something like this. However, just before mitosis takes place, these chromosomes will actually double up, duplicate themselves and make the classic X-shaped chromosomes that we see. So within the cell, there will be 23 pairs of these X-shaped chromosomes, so 46 of these all together. So the final part of this is that the DNA is duplicated, so a copy is made, that's what that means, to form X-shaped chromosomes. So within this part here, what we've just seen is three different things happen, getting the cell ready for mitosis. So we've had the cell grows, increasing the number of subcellular parts, its DNA forms into chromosomes, and those that DNA is then duplicated to form our X-shaped chromosome. So we've got an identical copy of DNA on either side. And then we've got the cell division stage, we've got the mitosis stage. And what happens on, the, on this stage is that all of the 46 X-shaped chromosomes will line up in the middle of the cell. So we have one all the way down to 46. Then the cell fibres will pull those X-shaped chromosomes apart. So one will go to either side of the cell remembering there's a direct, exact copy of each in each arm. When these chromosomes are pulled apart, you will then have a nucleus with 46 chromosomes in, but just with one of the copies. They're not an X-shaped chromosome anymore. I'm not going to fit them all in, but you'll have 46 chromosomes like that, and the same in here, 46 chromosomes like that. They were up here, 46 of the X shape, but they've now been pulled apart 
so you've got 46 in each one. And what you end up with mitosis is identical cells and only one cell division, which is different to meiosis, which comes up in paper two. Diffusion, osmosis and active transport are three different ways in which substances can be moved in and out of cells. So for example, in these three diagrams, we've got blue circles representing water and red circles representing salt. First of all, we're gonna show what happens with diffusion. Diffusion is when particles move from a high concentration, which I'll just abbreviate to conk, to a low concentration. So you can see here that there's a higher number of salt particles in the same space compared to over here. So what we see with diffusion is a net movement of particles from left to right, from a higher concentration to a lower concentration until they balance out. They are moving along the concentration gradient. So the gradient we always describe as being from high to low. So if they're moving from high to low, they are moving along the concentration gradients. This is um, the opposite thing to happens in what happens in active transport. So with this diagram we can show active transport and this time we've got the low concentration over here and the high concentration over here. If it was diffusion the salt would move this way from right to left. However, with active transport, this is the movement of particles against the concentration gradient. Just abbreviate that to conch gradient. And instead, the particles move from a low concentration to a high concentration. And for active transport, because this goes against what would naturally happen, this process of transport needs energy, so it requires energy, which the organism will normally get from respiration. So wherever there's active transport, you need energy. So this tends to be associated with cells that have lots of mitochondria to provide that energy for the active transport. The final example will be to show osmosis. And osmosis is the movement of water from a high concentration of water, which is also described as a dilute solution, just like a dilute ribena would be one with lots of water in it. Okay, so it's a high concentration of water or a dilute solution to a low concentration of water. or a concentrated solution, like a concentrated ribena that you're making. So in this case, what it means essentially is that they're, they're moving from where there's more water particles to where there's less. So the blue here is the water. So osmosis would see the movement of water from a high concentration of water, or a dilute solution where there's lots of water, to a low concentration of water through a partially permeable membrane, which is a membrane that only allows certain molecules through. Now we'll discuss a required practical, um, which involves osmosis for, for biology paper one. And with this practical, it is all about putting pieces of potato or cylinders of potato within different concentrations of sugar solution. So within the potato itself, it's important to say that there is going to be a particular concentration of sugar because the potato will contain both sugar and water. And the units for concentration are moles per decimeters cubed. So there's going to be a particular concentration with inside the potato already. So we can draw that, for example, some sugar in here. And what we will then do is put the potato in different solutions of sugar. So for example, we might put one in just pure water, so there's no sugar in there. We might put one 
in a solution of 0.5 moles per decimeters cubed and we might put one in a 1 mole per decimeters cubed solution. So the potatoes cylinders that you put in the solutions will have a certain concentration of sugar in themselves and then when you put them in the water this one will have no sugar in, this one will have 0.5 moles per decimeters cubed of sugar in and this one will have the highest concentration 1 moles per decimeters cubed of sugar in. And what you will investigate is how the mass of the potato cylinder changes and it's all to do with the movement of water and osmosis. So for example this one Osmosis is the movement of water from a high concentration of water to a low concentration. So because of the concentration gradient, the water will move into the potato, increasing the mass. And again, for this concentration here, there's still a concentration gradient. So the water will move into the potato. Whereas on this case here, the concentration gradient goes the other way. So there's a a lower concentration of water on the outside compared to the inside so you actually end up with mortar moving out of the potato making it weigh less. So what you might get is some results that look a little bit like this. Here we've got our concentration of our sugar solution 0 for pure water 0 0.5 and 1. Here we've got the mass of our potato before now this will never be the same because it's very difficult to cut the same, exactly the same shape cylinder and the same mass of potato cylinder. But it doesn't matter because we're measuring the change in mass. So we measure the mass of the potato before, then we put it into our sugar solutions, and then we are going to measure the mass of the potato afterwards. So for example, this one, you can see the potato has increased in mass for these two, but there's been a decrease in mass for this one along the bottom here. And we will then need to calculate our percentage change in mass. So we do that by doing the mass after minus the mass before all divided by the mass before or the original mass multiplied by 100. This is why it doesn't matter if the mass is started off different because you're taking it into account here. So if we did that, the percentage change in mass would be 25%, 18%, and to show the decrease, here it would be minus 25%. So you would then plot these points on the graph and draw a line of best fit as close to as many of the points as possible. And with this line of best fit, you can actually use it to work out the sucrose concentration or the sugar concentration of the potato at the start. Because at this point here, where it intersects the graph, this will tell you the sucrose or the sugar concentration of the potato at the start. Because at this point here, there is no change in mass. So the last topic is exchange surfaces. First of all, we need to discuss the reason why large organisms need exchange surfaces. And it's all to do with this, the surface area to volume ratio. So which one do you think has a larger surface area to volume ratio out of the elephant and the bacteria? Well, what most people think is the elephant, because they see that larger surface area and they point straight away to the elephant. However, it's the ratio of the surface area to the volume that's important. So we need to be able to calculate this. So apply your math skills here. To cal the calculate the surface area of this cube, we would do the area of one side, so 1 by 1, multiplied by 6, because it has 6 sides. For this cube, the surface area would be 3 times 3, and multiplied by 6 because it has 6 sides. So if we just looked at surface area alone, this would have a surface area of 6 centimetres squared and this would have a surface area of 54 centimetres squared. However, it's the surface area to volume ratio that we're interested in. So if we calculate the volume as well, this would be 1 times 1 times 1, which is 1 centimetres cubed. And this would be 3 times 3 times 3, 
which is 27 centimetres cubed. So if we're to write these as a ratio, surface area to volume ratio for this one would be 6 to 1. And for this larger cube, it would be 54 to 27. So these exchange surfaces are to increase the surface area. So for example, our lungs here, rather than just being two large sacs for oxygen diffusion, they are full of loads of little air sacs called alveoli. And these alveoli provide a greater surface area for the exchange of substances. So we can get our oxygen in quickly and efficiently and our carbon dioxide for out. Also, our small intestine, rather than just being smooth tubes like so, actually they're covered with loads of folds called villi. So these villi are very closely associated to blood vessels and this therefore allows the glucose that's inside the small intestine to leave and go into the blood really efficiently. Without that, the process would be really slow. And the final exchange surface that you need to know about is in relation to fish. So as the fish take in water through their mouths, that passes over gills within the fish, which are very um, closely associated with blood vessels so that the oxygen can get straight into the blood. But if we zoom into one of these gills, they have lots of gill filaments that stick out to increase the surface area. So here we have our gill filaments. And also to increase the surface area further, we have these little bumps called lamellae on the gill filaments as well to further increase the surface area and allow the oxygen to quickly diffuse into the blood. So we Topic 2 for Biology Paper 1 is called Organisation and it's all about how the different systems are organised within both animals and plants. First of all we'll look at how cells are organised. Cells are the basic building blocks of an organism and a group of similar cells working together to do a particular function is called a tissue. And then building on from that, a group of tissues that work together to form a particular function is an organ. And finally, a group of organs that work together to form a particular function is called an organ system. So I'm going to go through three different tissues that you need to know about, and they're all tissues within the stomach. So within the stomach you have muscular tissue and that tissue is for contraction which allows movement and within the stomach that is to churn the food around. There is also glandular tissue in there and this is to secrete things. So generally glandular tissue secretes things such as hormones and enzymes. So within the stomach it will secrete the digestive juices needed for digestion and secrete just means give out. Epithelial tissue is the final one that we need to know about for the stomach and this covers all parts of the body including the stomach. So it covers parts of the body. So epithelial tissue will be found outside and on the inner side of the stomach as well. So if we group this together, if we start off with a cell, we might have a single specialised muscle cell like this with a nucleus and lots of mitochondria. A group of cells working together, so lots of these muscle cells all working together to move the muscle. We call that a tissue. And these tissues, not only the muscle cells, but then the glandular tissue and the epithelial tissue, a group of different tissues will make an organ and then organs will make an organ system, like the digestive system just here. There are many different organ systems within the body, but you need to know the digestive system in particular in a lot of detail. 
So it looks something like this. Um, you would have the esophagus here. That's the tube that leads from your mouth, which is up here, down into the first organ, which we just talked about, which is the stomach. So your food would travel down your esophagus when you eat it into your stomach, and we'll talk about enzymes and things a little bit later on. And then the food will go through your small intestines, first of all, which are these ones in the middle just here. So the middle ones are the small intestines. And at this point here, this is where all the good nutrients that have been broken down are absorbed. And after the small intestine, it will go into the large intestine and it will move around the large intestine and finally leave your body. So the large intestine, that is where water is absorbed. So any excess water is taken back into your body. So I'll write large intestine here. Those are the only organs in the digestive system that the food actually travels through. But there's also another organ just here, which is really important. This one is called the pancreas. That is important because that produces enzymes. You've got this large organ here, which is the liver. That is important because it produces bile. And we'll talk about what bile does later. And then you've got on the liver here, you've got the gallbladder. And that stores the bile that the liver makes. We'll now talk about what enzymes are, and then we'll link them into the digestive system that we just talked about. So enzymes are described as biological catalysts. And you've heard the word catalyst in chemistry for something that speeds up a reaction. And that's what they do with inside the body. They speed up the chemical react reactions that take place within organisms. And there's two important parts that you need to know. If I was using this model to show an enzyme, this part at the front of the enzyme is called the active site. So the blue bit here is the enzyme and the front bit is the active site of the enzyme. And this is just something coming in to fit into the enzyme. For example, it could be a food molecule and this is called the substrate. With enzymes, the active site has a very particular shape to fit a particular substrate. And this idea is called the lock and key model. So here we've got the enzyme, which is our lock, which is a specific shape, and our key, which is our substrate, will fit in and it will move across and fit in to the enzyme. This lock and key model is actually a very simple model. And in reality, this is not quite how it works. In fact, the model that is true for an enzyme is called an induced fit model. And what that means is the active site changes shape ever so slightly as the substrate fits in to make sure it holds it in place. So it doesn't stay exactly like this. It will change shape as the substrate binds to hold it into place. That's called the induced fit model. The thing with enzymes is that they are not living, they are proteins, they're just very particular folded proteins, they're not living things and they are affected by temperature and also pH as well. So they have a preferred working temperature, the ones inside your body have an optimum, which means best, optimum temperature of around 37 degrees because that's the temperature inside your body. So you can see here we've got rate of reaction against temperature and it peaks and it would peak at 37 degrees C. They also have a preference for pH so you would see something like this for an enzyme that liked acidic conditions and a little shift along the pH line for some 
an enzyme that would like alkaline conditions, but still you'll get this peak of an optimum pH that they like to work at. At extreme temperatures or extreme pHs, the active site starts to change shape and the enzyme denatures. So at high temperatures, enzymes denature. Okay, we can't say that they die because they're proteins, they're not living in the first place, but they denature. And the active site changes shape, so the substrate no longer fits. So one can imagine here, the active site here changing shape slightly as it's got too hot and denatured, and then it would no longer fit the substrate that it's trying to bind. So now we know what enzymes are, we're going to talk about the enzymes that we use in digestion and the digestive system. So these are the three that we need to know about, amylase, protease and lipase. You'll notice that they all end in ase, that tells you that it's an enzyme that we're talking about. So amylase breaks down starch into sugar. So sugars, things like glucose or maltose or sucrose, anything that's ending in the O's is a sugar. So starch breaks down into sugar. So what that means is we've got a lot large molecule which is our starch and the enzyme will come down and it will break the molecule up and you'll end up with the simple sugar molecules. Protease turns proteins into amino acids and lipase breaks down fats which are also called lipids hence the lipase, lip there, lip there, and it turns it into fatty acids and glycerol. So where do they work? Well the amylase starts off working in the mouth. So in the mouth there are glands called salivary glands and amylase is produced in the salivary glands and that is where starch begins to be broken down in the, in the digestive system. If you were to eat food, that would then go down the esophagus into the stomach. In the stomach, there are acidic conditions. The acid that's in your stomach is called hydrochloric acid, and that is there to kill bacteria. It's one of the defences of the body, to kill bacteria. And there is an enzyme in here, a protease, that likes acidic conditions. So in here we have protease, and that is going to start to break down the proteins. However, the majority of the enzyme activity occurs in the small intestine. Here we have all three enzymes at work. We have amylase, we have different proteases, and we have lipase. So just to recap, at the top in salivary glands, that's where amylase was starting to work, protease in the stomach, and all three of them in the small intestine. Now, in fact, all three of them are produced by this organ here, which is the pancreas. Remember we said that produces enzymes. So that produces all three enzymes as well, and that can send those enzymes to different these different organs in the digestive system. But the thing we want to link to now is the idea that in the stomach there are acidic conditions, whereas in the small intestine there are alkaline conditions. And this is where the liver, the gallbladder and that liquid called bile comes in. Because we said the liver produces bile and we said the gallbladder stores the bile. And the bile does two things, which I'll write over here. The first thing that it does is neutralises acid. And the second thing that it does is it emulsifies fats. What that means is if you had a large globule of fat, emulsifies mean it will break it down into smaller 
droplets of fat. So when our food comes through here, it's going to get coated in hydrochloric acid. It's okay for the enzymes that work in there because they like hydro they like acidic conditions. However, when that food then goes out of the stomach into the small intestine, what you don't want to happen is for lots of the acid to be brought into the small intestine because these enzymes like alkaline conditions. So having a little squirt of bile at the top here as it leaves the acid means that one, the acid is neutralised, so that's not going to affect the conditions in the small intestine. And secondly, the fats are emulsified to make digestion easier when they reach the small intestine. There is also a required practical for enzymes, which I'll introduce now. The question that we're going to ask for this practical is how does pH affect enzyme activity? So we first start by heating water over a Bunsen burner to act as a water bath or you could also alternatively use a water bath if you wanted to do so. And we want that water to get to an optimum en temperature for enzymes which will be around 35 to 37 degrees C. Then within in our boiling tube we are going to put some enzymes, so one centimetres cubed let's say of amylase, if we're going to investigate amylase, that's our enzyme and we are going to put one centimetres cubed of a particular pH buffer, so that buffer is just a solution that has a particular pH, in this case we'll start off with pH 5 solution so here we've got enzyme and the pH buffer in the in the boiling tube within the water bath and that will get to the optimum temperature for the enzyme. We then need to prepare our spotting tile which is just a plastic tile with dimples on top and into that spotting tile we need to put a drop of iodine. Iodine is what we use in food tests because it tests for starch and if starch is present it will go from an orange browny colour to black. So when you put the iodine in all of the spotting tile droplets will be orange the colour of iodine And then when we are ready, what we need to do now is add something into the boiling tube for the amylase to break down. And if you remember, amylase breaks down starch into sugar. So what we're going to add is some starch. So if we add, as our next step, 5 centimetres cubed, let's say, of starch to the boiling tube and mix it. If we were to take one alveoli and zoom it up a bit, it might look a little something like this. It provides a really large surface area for gas exchange. Large surface area. So you've got oxygen coming into the lungs that is going to be moving into this on the outside, which represents a blood vessel. And the carbon dioxide from the blood plasma will be diffusing in the opposite direction out. So the way they're adapted then, they've got very thin walls, these alveoli. They've got a large network of capillaries that run close to them. And they have a large surface area. Moving on to the heart, we need to know Firstly, about the different chambers of the heart. So there are two chambers at the top of the heart and two chambers at the bottom of the heart. Separating these are heart valves, which we'll talk about later on. So there's one there, these flaps here that are between the top and the bottom, and there is one here and one here, for example. So they're heart valves. The bottom chambers are called the ventricles 
When you look at the heart, however, the left and the right are opposite. You need to think about it as if you are looking at a patient. So if you look at this heart, this is the left hand side and this is the right hand side. It's opposite to what you'd normally think. So this is the left ventricle, the bottom chamber of the heart. This is the left atrium, which is the top chamber. This is the right atrium. And this here is the right ventricle. Then we need to work out what all these little tubes going into and out of the heart are called. Well, we need to remember that anything that moves blood away from the heart is called an artery and anything which takes blood to the heart is called a vein. If we start with the blood in the left ventricle, so let's imagine here that this left ventricle has been filled up with blood. Well, this has a really thick muscle compared to the other side. You'll see it in diagrams. The left-hand side of the heart is a lot thicker. This is because this pushes the blood all around the body. So the blood is forced through these valves here and out to the rest of the body. Because blood is going away from the heart out of this one, it's an artery and is called the aorta. It's the main artery in the heart that takes blood to the rest of the body. When that blood goes to the body, it will give the cells oxygen, it will give the cells glucose, and it will take back any waste products. The blood then needs to come back to the heart, so it's gone down to the rest of the body, and it now needs to go back to the heart, and it does so through the veins. So the blood travels back through the veins, and it needs to go in here or it might come from the top of the body in through here. This vessel here is called the vena cava, it's the main vein. So V for vena cava is a vein, A for aorta is an artery, and this takes blood back to the heart. This is blood that doesn't have very much oxygen in it, in it anymore because it has given it to the cells. The valves open and this gets pushed into the ventricle. From here, the blood needs to be taken to the lungs to get oxygen. So this is where it's pushed out of the left ventricle, out of these vessels here. And because they're going to, to, the, to the lungs, they are called the pulmonary arteries because they're taking blood away from the heart to the lungs. So anything involving lungs are called pulmonary. So it'll take it to the lungs and when they're there, they will get filled, the blood will get filled with oxygen and replenished and any carbon dioxide will be removed and you will breathe that out. Then the oxygenated blood comes back from the lungs and it goes into these vessels over here and because they're coming from the lungs, they're called pulmonary, so they're the pulmonary and because they're going to the heart, they're called veins. So the pulmonary veins, the blood flows through those into the left atrium and then it will start again, going down into the left ventricle, out of the aorta and round the rest of the body. Because it enters the heart twice and we've got a system where it goes round the body and then a separate system where it goes up to the lungs, that's why we call it a double circulatory system. So the main liquid that's in blood, the main clear liquid, is called plasma and that is where waste products are dissolved into. So things like carbon dioxide, when that's travelling through the blood vessels, that is dissolved in the plasma. Within that plasma liquid there are also several different cells. There are red blood cells. They have a pigment called haemoglobin in them and that haemoglobin binds oxygen and these are specialised cells, they don't have a nucleus because their only job is to carry as much oxygen as it could possibly bind to the haemoglobin in the red blood cell. We've also got 
white blood cells and they are involved in fighting pathogens. And the final thing you need to know about are irregular shaped parts of cells called platelets and they will help to clot the blood if you are bleeding. So there are three different blood vessels that you need to be aware of. There are the arteries that take blood away from the heart. These have a particularly thick muscular wall because they carry blood at high pressure. So when it comes out of the heart, it comes under a lot of pressure. So they carry blood at high pressure. There are also the veins which take blood back to the heart. These have thinner walls and they have a bigger hole in the middle, which is called a lumen. That's the hole in the middle. They have a bigger lumen. Blood travels through at low pressure. And the veins also have valves inside of them to stop the blood flowing backwards. The final blood vessel that you need to know about is one with very thin walls and that is the capillary. The capillaries have very thin walls, only one cell thick, so that the substances within the blood can diffuse out of the blood and into the cells around it. This section is on cardiovascular disease, which is disease associated with the heart. And the heart itself as well as supplying oxygenated blood to the rest of the body, it is also covered in its own arteries that wrap around the heart, which you can also see in this diagram here, and these are called the coronary arteries. However, some people um, have problems with their coronary arteries. If we take a section of the artery down here, some people have a problem whereby the inside of their artery starts to build up with fatty deposits. Perhaps if they've got a poor diet or they don't do much exercise, for example, that artery will start to build up with fatty deposits. And that affects the blood flow through those coronary arteries and therefore it affects the amount of oxygen that is supplied to the heart muscle. And that can lead to a heart attack. So it can cause lack of oxygen to the heart and ultimately it can lead to a heart attack. So there are a few different ways that you can overcome this. You can put a wire mesh called a stent inside your arteries to make sure that the arteries stay open and to widen them, allowing more blood and oxygen to your heart muscles. So you can see here this stent, this wire mesh, opening up the arteries. Alternatively, you could take drugs called statins to try and reduce the fatty buildup that you have inside the arteries. In an exam, you might be given some information that you need to then evaluate what this means is put the pros and cons and then your own conclusion as to which one is better. So for the stent, the things that's good is it lowers risk of heart attack and the surgery is quick to fit a scent. A lot of people have this done in emergency situations but the sur surgery is very quick. Many people have more than one stent in place as well. The downside to this, or some of the downside, is that you have a risk of heart attack during surgery and you also have risks of blood clots as well. So with statins, the way that they work is they're trying to reduce this fatty buildup which is caused by cholesterol. So they reduce the bad cholesterol that is in your blood and that bad cholesterol is called LDL cholesterol and this reduces then the fatty deposits within the arteries. So this shares the um, positive of the stent in that it lowers the risks of heart attacks and it also increases 
the HDL, which is the good cholesterol in your body, which helps them to reduce that bad cholesterol. Statins, they also think, can prevent other diseases as well. So that's another positive thing through taking the statins. But a few downsides to statins are that you have to take them regularly, so you mustn't forget to take them. That can come, become a little bit of a nuisance. There are some side effects, like any drugs, from taking the statins. And also that the effect is not instant. With a stent, if you put a stent in, you will have an instant effect. But with the drugs, that takes a little bit longer. So if you have a continuing problem with your heart, you may need a complete heart transplant. And obviously, um, if people are on the donor register, you may well be lucky enough to receive a donor heart to be transplanted. If you don't need a whole transplant, it could be that you need a particular part of your heart, for example, valves. And you can actually have replacement valves. You can get biological replacements and that is where you will take a, a valve from either a human donor or you could also get a valve from another animal like a cow or a pig and they could be placed into your heart. The other option would be a mechanical valve which it will be a man-made valve made out of a different material but it will still do the same job. This guy in the picture here is wearing another alternative if you're waiting for a transplant and that is an artificial heart. So the heart in the body is just a pump. So this person here is wearing an artificial heart within a backpack which is just a pump which is helping pump the blood around his body. This is a temporary solution, not a permanent solution, but it can help prolong life while waiting for a transplant but it has the obvious risk because it's mechanical of electrical or mechanical fa failure which is going to be uh, have terrible consequences for the person that is using it. While someone's waiting for an operation in hospital they may also need to use artificial blood and this is just a saline solution which just makes up the volume of any blood that you have lost. So if you have an accident and you have a lot of blood loss, you might be waiting for a blood transfusion. So in the meantime, you may be provided with some artificial blood, which is just a salt solution to make sure the volume of your blood remains at a sufficient level. So all the things that we discussed with the heart already are examples of non-communicable diseases. A non-communicable disease is something that cannot be spread between organisms. So if you've got a blocked artery, that's not something that you can pass on to somebody else. While we're on the topic of health, you may need to know the, the definition for health in general, and that is the state of physical and mental well-being. So there are several different risk factors that can increase the likelihood of you developing a non-communicable disease, like perhaps cancer or coronary heart disease or anything like that. So there are lifestyle factors that come into play. There are things such as smoking. So smoking is a risk factor for a number of diseases. Alcohol. Obesity and a lack of exercise, any of these lifestyle factors can increase the chance of you developing a non communicable disease. Also, the environment that you live in, for example, if you work somewhere where there is a lot of air pollution, or whether you work with something that has a specific environmental hazard like the material asbestos. And if you breathe that in, that can cause major problems later on in life. You may also, as well as lifestyle and environment, have a, a genetic predisposition to a particular disease, like some cancers, for example. Your genes can increase the likelihood of you developing a particular non-communicable disease.
Within the body, there are two different types of tumours that you can develop. These are benign tumours and malignant tumours. Benign tumours are tumours that grow and stay in the same place. So normally, these don't cause too much of a problem, unless they're pressing on some nerves or a vital organ or something like that. Normally, if they just grow and stay in one place, they don't cause a problem and they can be re removed relatively easily. The malignant tumour is the one where cells break off, travel through the bloodstream, and invade healthy tissues. So they actually break off and move around your body and this is otherwise known as cancer. So malignant tumours are cancerous. Their cells break off, travel through the blood bloodstream and invade other healthy tissues. So like before you can have risk factors um, for certain cancers like we said before, smoking, obesity, Also things such as for skin cancer, your UV exposure, so how much you're out in the sunlight um, and also viral infection because some viral infections can actually increase your chance of getting cancer. For example, if you contract hepatitis B or hepatitis C, that can increase your risk or your likelihood of getting liver cancer. And like before as well, genetics can also play a part and increase your chance of getting some cancers. Moving on to something completely different now, the next few slides are about organisation in plants. So this image shows the cross section of a leaf at the top. This layer here is called the waxy cuticle and the whole purpose of the waxy cuticle is to prevent water loss from the plant. Where water is lost through the plant is through the stomata, which are the holes at the bottom. And these are controlled by these cells either side called the guard cells. Now the plant actually doesn't really want to lose water, but the stomata is open to allow carbon dioxide in and oxygen out. So to allow that, unfortunately, water is also lost out of the stomata but the guard cells can help control the amount of water lost. So if the plant doesn't have much water available, then these guard cells will lose water and become flaccid. And when they are flaccid, that will cause the stomata to close. When there are, is plenty of water available, the water will move into the guard cells by osmosis and they will fill with water and that will allow the stomata to be open. And when they're filled with water, we say they are turgid. So with these guard cells, they have a very thin outer wall and a thicker inner wall and that helps them make these shapes to open and close the stomata. Other parts of the leaf then, the top and the bottom of the leaf have a layer of tissue called the epidermal tissue, which is similar to the epithelial tissue in animals in which it just covers the bottom and the top of the leaf. It's quite thin to allow sunlight to come through the top. The tissue underneath, which comprises B and C, both of those layers, is called the mesophyll tissue. Layer B is called the palisade mesophyll because it is made up of these palisade cells. These are specialised plant cells which are full of chloroplasts because this is where the majority of the photosynthesis takes place. Underneath the palisade mesophyll, this section C here, which is this section, is called the spongy mesophyll. 
and the spongy mesophyll has lots of gaps for gaseous diffusion. What this means is it allows carbon dioxide to move through this spongy layer and reach the palisade cells at the top where photosynthesis can take place. The final tissues that we know, need to know about is this bundle just here. This is a cross section with loads of tubes in it. And you probably won't need to know the word of the tissue, but it's vascular tissue. But you do need to know it's made up of tubes called the xylem and the phloem. The final plant tissue that you need to know about is the meristem tissue. And this tissue is found in the tips of the roots and the shoots. And linking back to stem cells, this meristem tissue is where our undifferentiated cells can come from. And these cells can turn into any type of plant cell. The next section is on the process called translocation. Translocation is the process by which food is transported, food or sugar is transported through the plant. And this involves one of those tubes that we looked at in the leaf called the phloem. And if we looked at the phloem, it would look something a little bit like this, where the cells are connected together, they're elongated, and between the cells there is pores to allow the substance to flow through. Now the food goes in both directions, the food or the sugar goes in both directions through the phloem, so it could move up or down the plant. Here we've got pores in the end wall to allow the sugar to move through. And the cells themselves have very few subcellular parts because they don't want anything to get in the, in the way of the sugar that's moving up and down. So within the plant you will have translocation from the point that the sugar is made in the leaves in photosynthesis and when the sugar is made the phloem will then transport that around the plant wherever you need it so you may need it for respiration over here or you may need it for example to be stored underground. Transpiration on the other hand is water loss from a plant. And this movement of water occurs in the xylem. So we said the phloem carries the sugar and the xylem carries the water, but the movement is a little bit different. First of all, the xylem is actually made up of dead cells, and because they're dead, they need a little bit of support. So they are strengthened, the walls are strengthened by a molecule called lignin. Then water can only move upwards. Whereas we said the food or the sugar could move in both directions in the plant, in the xylem the water only moves upwards. And as well as the water you might get um, ions as well that have been brought up through the roots moving up here. So the water and ions move upwards. And this is called the transpiration stream. The movement of water through the plant is this transpiration stream and it's continuous. As soon as water is lost out of the leaves through the stomata, then more will be drawn up through the xylem tissue into the leaf and so on. So as soon as that happens, water is drawn up from the roots through the xylem and out again. So it's a continual transpiration stream. So there are different factors that affect the rate of transpiration. First one we'll talk about is light intensity and if you increase the light intensity you increase the transpiration rate so the more intense the light the more the water is going to be moving through the plant and out of the plant. So this is going to be happening in the daytime because the stomata are open trying to get those gases in for photosynthesis the stomata are going to subsequently lose lots of water and we're going to have a really high transpiration rate. If you increase the temperature, you also increase the transpiration rate. 
because you have more water evaporating from the plant. So if you've got a hot day, you're going to have particles with more energy and you're going to have more evaporation out of those stomata. With airflow, if you increase the airflow, so if there's more wind, for example, you will increase the transpiration rate. And that can be explained by thinking about the leaf. If that lost water molecules out of the stomata, if there was no wind, at a certain point you'd have a similar level of water molecules in and out of the plant, and there would be no net movement because you won't have a concentration gradient for them to move along. But as soon as the wind comes along, takes those water mo molecules outside away, you will then have a concentration gradient that's maintained, so the water will move out again. So if you increase the airflow, you're then going to maintain the concentration gradient, and more water will be able to leave the plant. And keeping the same idea, if you increase the humidity, which is increasing the water in the air around the plant, you can see that because of the concentration gradient, that will actually decrease the transpiration rate because less water will be able to leave the plant because you are decreasing the concentration gradient for diffusion. And the piece of equipment that you can use to measure the rate of transpiration is called a potometer. So you can see here you've got your living plant which will be taking up water and you can measure the rate at which it takes up water and therefore the rate of transpiration by measuring how quickly this air bubble moves along the ruler. So you could get a certain distance over time to measure the rate of transpiration.